Ready. Welcome now officially, everyone. Visegrad Inside Breakfast. Uh, not the last one uh, before the summer break, but uh, I would say one of the most important one because it's around the Visegrad Group presidency. Its focus on Central European cooperation gives us an opportunity to summarize, to uh, to uh, experiment with uh, you know new directions, come up with uh, proposals. But first and foremost. Uh, try to, to recap what, what we know about the state of Central European cooperation. Um, before we begin, let me do a bit of advertising. We have just released, as, as of yesterday, uh, we have it on our site, new report about the future of 3Cs initiative. From the perspective of democratic security, we put forward an ambitious project in the report one of the most ambitious recommendations, I think, so far to make uh, the 3C Civil Society Forum part of the uh, future format, part of the essence of the future format of the, of the 3C's cooperation. Do go to the site and, and download. Um, you, you will later receive from my colleagues in the chat box maybe a link and the, and the code. If you haven't subscribed yet, you can download it for free. I mean, to your register for the first month for free. Today, we host two fantastic guest speakers. Uh, first, let me welcome Alexandra Rybinska. Uh, she's a columnist. She's an analyst of foreign policy, uh, writing for conservative uh, Polityce, uh, uh, several other outlets in, in Polish. And she's also a member of the board of uh, the Warsaw Institute of the Polish-German Cooperation Foundation, several other institutions, and also Janusz Seki from uh, literature and po politics, uh, uh, the one of the most established, uh, if not the most established uh, outlet in Hungary uh, with, with long form journalism, the, the you would say the, uh, the one that you really want to read to understand not only the, on the surface, the Hungarian politics, but look into the depth of, uh, of it. And we've been also so fortunate to have authors of Visegrad Insight publishing, uh, republishing some of the pieces or publishing pieces with uh, literature and politics in Hungarian. And today's topic is uh, the Visegrad group uh, um, presidencies, two of them, as they converge, Polish presidency has came to an end. Uh, after one year, a very special year, of course, and uh, it has uh, its impact. The, the, the year, the pandemic year, has brought a lot of turmoil. We'll ask Alexandra in a moment to uh, recap it, and then we'll move to Janusz to recap Hungarian uh, presidency ambitions of, you know, the, that is very young, six days into the, into the presidency, to see what's, what's behind there, how it, how it also um, coincide with other political developments in Hungary. And then we begin the discussion about uh, the state of um, uh, Central European cooperation. Alexandra, if I may, uh, what would you, uh, what would you uh, highlight, what would you put as a highlight of, of the now complete pres uh, presidency of Poland in V4? Well, I think one of the priorities of the presidency since it started during, um, during the pandemic, the pandemic was already on, so um, it, it, I think the name of the main, main slogan of the presidency was back on track. So uh, the idea was to uh, basically uh, try to solve uh, the crisis that COVID-19 brought about, and then of course recovery. So I think one of the main goals also of the Polish presidency of the V4 was to uh, establish uh, a, a recovery fund uh, that would be as large as possible and of course um, would especially take into consideration the interests and needs of the V4 countries. Um, and that is uh, certainly uh, something that, uh, that happened. We have a recovery fund, uh, it is quite substantial. Um, but at the same time, we also have to uh, look at uh, a little bit critically because um, in the end uh, today, the European Commission still has not agreed uh, has not approved the Polish National Recovery Fund. Um, this is something that is still open and apparently the discussions are still ongoing and the Polish side says they are quite uh, strained. Uh, and we also looking at Hungary, uh, the recovery fund hasn't been approved either and the uh, European Parliament is pushing for, um, to actually putting pressure on the European Commission to not approve it. So um, this is uh, 
uh, you would say, half of the success for the time being, since we have a recovery fund, but apparently it is going to be uh, concerning these two V4 countries, it will be uh, still a matter of discussion and maybe a means of putting pressure on them. So this is a, something that might come back somewhere in the autumn. And this is something the Polish government expects to happen actually. And then it will be connected in some way or another with the idea of a rule of law mechanism. So you know, there still might be a lot of trouble ahead to actually get the money from the recovery fund. So um, we have a recovery fund. It is quite substantial. Poland, I think, has made, uh, has, uh, you know, managed to get a lot of money, uh, but at least for the moment it is theoretical. So um, this is, I think, um, a half of a success for the for the time being. Of course, the other subject was Belarus, and I think um, that was heavily on the agenda of the V4 group. Um, and we uh, have seen Poland has taken initiative. Uh, V4 countries have decided to uh, give visa-free travel to. Uh, Belarusian citizens. Um, today we have economic sanctions on Belarus, which uh, is a success. Since uh, well, it is a success. Well, we could talk Belarus is a is a subject in itself. But now uh, Lukashenko needs uh, the economic uh, support of Russia because uh, the economy, Belarusian economy, is so uh, uh, unreformed since uh, 1990. Basically, it, is, uh, it has certain sectors. It's very easy to put sanctions on on, on that economy. So. Uh, Lukashenko will now have a lot of problems to maintain a standard of living in, uh, in Belarus. But this is what we could consider uh, a success of his presidency, his Polish presidency of the uh, V4. Um, then, of course, that we had uh, many subjects and somehow got lost um, during this year. Was a, I remember there was talk about establishing uh, an airline for the V4 countries, which obviously since... Um, the others don't have uh, national carriers anymore. It would probably be lot Polish airlines, but this somehow got lost because we really were focused uh, during this year on the pandemic and on Belarus, which has taken uh, the forefront. And in some ways, uh, the Polish position, especially on Russia, was vindicated when Joseph Borrell went to Moscow and uh, uh, was uh, well treated by Vladimir Putin the way he was uh, treated. But then. Uh, the next subject was uh, connecting to that was actually the uh, Nord Stream 2 pipeline. And here we can say um, that it was actually, um, well, uh, since the president changed in the United States in the meantime, and uh, Donald Trump lost the elections and we had Joe Biden, and Joe Biden decided to revive uh, relationships, transatlantic relationship, especially with Germany, uh, in view of a rivalry with China, trying to pull Germany over to its side, has decided to actually accept, um, to actually let the project go on, to let um, the Nord Stream 2 pipeline be constructed and has renounced sanctions. So this was uh, not a success for Poland. We could say that in the end, uh, this has ended up as being a failure. So uh, this is maybe the biggest failure of this, of this V4 presidency. Now, concerning the uh, coordination in the V4 group, I think uh, we could say there are two main countries really in the V4, and that is Poland and Hungary. Uh, and now Hungary has a tendency, uh, Viktor Orban has a tendency to always uh, stre stress that um, Poland is the regional leader, Poland is uh, the country that uh, should lead the region. But at the, I have the impression that he uses this as some, sign, some sort of a smoke screen that he can hide behind. And then it actually um, try to put uh, policies in, uh, in action that are in Hungary's interest. And we have seen small uh, pockets of tension, uh, we could call that, um, which one subject is, of course, Russia. That is, uh, uh, the V4 group stands on, on, on Russia is not uh, united. It is not a united front. And clearly here, Hungary has broken, broken out of the of the mold. And then we also have the question of uh, rule of law. We have seen that for Slovakia and the Czech Republic have actually supported the mechanism, rule of law mechanism, and uh, Hungary and Poland have not. So this was another split uh, clearly in the V4 group uh, over that subject matter. And this is also something that is going to return since uh, in autumn, uh, we will be going at the rule of law question again, and then we will see uh, how the V4 group will manage to uh, if it will manage to find a common position on that, and I doubt it uh, highly, 
that will happen. Um, so in, in a short recap is what, what I really seen what to me was important during that year. Of course, there were many other subjects, but you will forgive me if uh, well, my main focus in, in my work is to actually focus on German-Polish cooperation, so I'm not that much immersed into the before um, in order to give you a, a, a better uh, expertise. Thank you so much. Well, uh, one, one would also say that uh, V4 does not exist without uh, the, the German factor, so to say. I mean, one uh, from the economic and sometimes political perspective, V4 is really somehow strictly connected not only to Europe, but specifically to Germany. Wouldn't you agree, Janos? What are the ambitions of Hungarian presidency and what, what, um, what do you think is the dynamics to expect within the next 12 months uh, of the Hungarian presidency? Well, Hungarian Prime Minister Viktor Orban has mentioned three priorities of uh, Hungarian V4 presidency. One is restarting the economy, proving that the Hungarian economic model, which he equates with the V4 model, the model of the region is viable. Uh, the essence would be to attract investments and uh, low taxes. Hungary didn't, doesn't join the OECD initiated 50% corporate in income tax agreement. The second is, as he says, security, closely tied to migration, which is his main uh, political project these years. Uh, we don't support, I mean, Hungary doesn't support the redistribution of migrants, which holds extra risk at, in the current health situation, as Orban says. The third one, uh, the third priority is EU enlargement in the Western Balkans, which means primarily Serbia. Now, taking, the, taking this one by one, uh, seen from here, uh, the major feat, the major, major ach achievement of Polish V4 presidency was uh, securing the seven year MFF and the next generation recovery fund without a, a veto, B, uh, uh, with a, a, a watered up a version of V of uh, rule of law conditionality. Uh, Although uh, Orban tried to claim it, this achievement as his own, he called it his own D-Day, using this very military metaphor in his, as his, as his usual um, way of formulating things. Now, as it, it would mean uh, Continuing the Hungarian economic economic model with with EU funds, actually Hungary doesn't reject, of course, uh, the recovery fund, just the loan part of it. That's three billion something, which is huge, but still uh, uh, less than half of the uh, whole sum. Uh, which I think is uh, rather the result of, of a fear of uh, political political control. Which what is what is the Hungarian model? In my view, it is a relying on manufacturing primarily, which is a, a very twentieth century concept of of economic development be uh, what uh, experts call the relational economy, which is not either a, a command economy nor a, a kind of free market policy. 
but uh, a politically uh, uh, defined uh, economy where relations to the whole patronal, patronal network, uh, which is on, one, on the one hand political, on the other hand economic, uh, is more important than uh, 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 performance on the market. C, uh, uh, which is a Hungarian specialty, uh, very high government redistribution of incomes, uh, which is in, Hung in Hungary, as opposed to other V4 countries, it is uh, quite very high. It's on, on, it's, uh, on West European levels. And uh, uh, also, it means heavy government influence, heavy government control, either in the form of nationalization or in the form of, of, uh, of incorporating it in the, in the power pyramid uh, in the economy. I think, I mean, uh, for instance, one element of uh, the Moraviewski government's success was, as you may remember, uh, the Germans condoning uh, the, the um, uh, buyout of Polska Press from a German company by government company Orlen. Now this uh, was, there was a, a, a side episode of this story, which few people noticed, and it wasn't really public at that time that the, the fusion of, I don't, don't want to go into the details, if you ask me, I will, I can, I can relate what I can, what I know, but uh, Mol, the Hungarian oil and gas giant, uh, practically helped, promised help to the Poles by buying Lotus's 30% uh, of shares in buying uh, Lotus's uh, Gdańsk refinery, which is supposed now it seems to be. Uh, 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 to be promised to Aramco, but it was at that time a, a sign of Hungarian help. Now, these companies in Hungary, Hung, Hungary Mall is, uh, are not uh, government owned, but they are part of the system of patronal economy. They are not uh, uh, high tech companies. They just live off their and continue their communist age monopolies. Now, as for security and migration, I mean, it defines uh, Hungary's uh, relationship with other V4 countries. You know that uh, Orban is friendly with uh, Babish and Zeman because of their anti-migration politics. Uh, it was very telling that recently when, when Heger, 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 or Heger, I don't know the exact pronunciation, the, the Slovak prime minister visited Budapest, uh, Orban praised uh, the, admir the admirable uh, performance of Slovak economy in the last 10 years. Now, this was practically uh, the FITSO era when growth actually slowed down. I mean, uh, Orban likes uh, Slovakian politicians be mostly because he, they oppose immigration or he thinks they oppose it. It's the basis of personal relation. And it's the same. Uh, is the same with Poland. 
three, uh, the enlargement in the Western Balkans and Serbia. I think this is A, related to migration issues, B, uh, it's political sympathy for uh, Vucic's uh, uh, authoritarian and populist system. C, it's uh, in harmony with uh, Orban's pro-Russian and pro-Chinese politics. Uh, Serbia joining the EU would mean uh, another pro-Russian and pro-Chinese uh, country in the e within the EU, another black sheep. Yeah, Janos, let me uh, interrupt you here, and I'm sure we will continue on this theme. Um, but now that both you, of you were, um, in a way, summarizing the, the presidency or your parts of the presentation with reference to, to the state of mutual relationship, let me ask you a direct question about that. How is this relationship, how would you assess the state of this relationship? Uh, I'll first turn to Alexandra for that. Uh, between Poland and Hungary. Uh, you mentioned a couple of themes that united uh, the governments on the position within EU on rule of law question, the MFF. Uh, Janos was also adding a couple of uh, topics. But at the same time, you hinted, both of you hinted to disparities in the perspective on, for instance, Russia, or on the other hand, what might be uh, the, the perspective on EU, even the EU funds and the rejection, rejection of, the, of the loan of the part of the, um, of the multi-annual financial fund, uh, which, is, which is based no, on- No, 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 on the recovery fund. On the recovery, on the recovery package. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, taking these, but maybe others into, into consideration, uh, how would you evaluate disparities with the, the differences between the two in the approach to European politics, European foreign policy? And where do you see the bond holding strong, where it is, you know, uh, still the, the, the core of the, as you also evaluated, the core of the Visegrad Group cooperation, as the two countries seem to be still leading the charge. On, on the Visegrad group. And this is also the time to say that we have maybe two minutes for each of you for a brief recap. By no means this will be the end. We will continue into the next half an hour of the record. And uh, this gives me an opportunity to invite already questions and comments to the chat box, uh, flagging raised hands, and we'll begin a conversation shortly after. Alexandra. Well, I don't think that uh, the aim of the Visegrad group is to agree on everything. and. Uh... Uh, it is a forum of coordination of policies, and uh, there will be uh, policies that we'll not agree upon, um, obviously. Um, but uh, I mean, the, 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 v, the V4 format, um, I think, beginning with uh, the migrant mig migration crisis of 2015, has really become visible. And I think um, that uh, before it, well, there was actually a lack of ideas what to do with this format. Um, it was. Uh, it had fulfilled its role uh, as a format that was supposed to lead uh, its member countries into European Union and NATO. And then after that happened, um, there was a lack of ideas what to do with it before. So I think the migration crisis paradoxically has uh, given the V4 a chance to, to exist and to actually be heard. Its countries uh, suddenly were heard since they together opposed uh, migration quotas, the uh, EU redistribution system of, of migrants, of refugees, and, and this has become then a format that uh, allows these countries to eventually block certain EU policies, uh, to have a voice in discussions over them. And uh, I think as such, it, it, it functions quite well. Um, but then there will always be subjects where the member countries will not agree uh, upon and, and will have differing um, positions. Now, I think what also the uh, Hungarian presidency is apparently aiming at is uh, to participate in this conference on the future of Europe and to actually uh, make proposals concerning um, what the European Union should look like in the next year. So um, this is also the question of integration versus enlargement. So the V4 says we need enlargement, not only to the Western Balkans, but also the European uh, Eastern Partnership countries. Um, so we should focus on uh, the European Union should focus its efforts on that. 
And then on the other hand, you have Germany, France, you know, where you clearly can feel that um, the stance is, no, we need deeper integration. Um, the, the enlargement process is over. Uh, whatever we could enlarge, we did. And uh, this is why the whole enlargement process in the Western Balkans is so hopelessly stuck. Um, apart from, of course, bilateral issues like Bulgaria blocking, um, there's the general, um, I would say, a tension between proponents of enlargement and integration. And this is one, one of the major issues, I think, in the next couple of years. And this is apparently what Orban wants to be for to focus on. So um, to participate in the... Uh, in uh, the future of Europe, yeah. how what what is the European Union going to look at? Subsidiarity, um, and yes. I think there, Poland and Hungary largely agree of, upon all these issues, and this is something that they share. Thank you. We'll stop here, but we'll continue on several of the themes uh, in a moment. Janos, uh, in two minutes, a recap of the oh bilateral. Yes. I mean, uh, a uh, Orban has his has published his so-called seven points about the future of the EU, which is a very um, uh, courageous plan. I mean, supplanting the European Parliament with a, with a body of constitutional courts and, and uh, also em emphasizing identity. So uh, Alexandra has mentioned what, what they agree on. I would mention I would mention what they disagree on, which is uh, the, the uh, Russian and, to a certain degree, the Chinese issue between Poland and Hungary. Poland, as we know, is very anti-Russian and, uh, of course, anti-Chinese, while Hungary is pro and pro. On the on the other hand, uh, this morning I read an interesting piece of news about a joint Hungarian nuclear power plant project in Kaliningrad of all places. Uh, I'm quite surprised I, I cannot, cannot interpret this so far. Yeah. Okay, uh, that's that's indeed one of the questions for the off the record speculation, perhaps even. Uh, thank you all.